Good afternoon and welcome to the Subcommittee on Planning Dispositions and Concessions. I'm Council Member Ben Kalish, Chair of the Subcommittee. We're joined today by Council Member Ruben Diaz Sr., Chaim Deutsch, uh, Land Use Chair Salamanca, and Carlina Rivera, who has an item on the agenda. Today we'll be holding three public hearings and we'll be voting on four projects. The application we'll be voting on were subject to prior hearings. Land Use 66, to which we heard previously, will be laid over. We will vote to approve we will be voting on and may approve land use item 65, the, 19, the 1490 Southern Boulevard application for property located in Chair Salamanca's district in the Bronx. HPD seeks approval for the designation of a urban development action area and approval of the urban development action area project UDAP. The project area is zoned R7-1 with a C-2-4 overlay. The approvals will facilitate the redevelopment of the site into a 10-story mixed-use building containing approximately 114 affordable independent residences for seniors with a percentage set aside for formerly homeless and superintendents unit. A nonprofit would provide support services for seniors as well as on-site property management services. There would also be a ground floor community facility space and a rear yard terrace for residents. Do we have a statement from uh, Land Use Chair Salamanca? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Kalos. G good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair Kalos. Um, we're voting on an exciting project with incredible potential in my district today, 1490 Southern Boulevard. The city is facing an affordable housing crisis in our race to build and preserve 300,000 units. Each and every one of us council members should be doing our part in getting the city to this goal. Today, I have approved more than 4,000 brand new affordable units in my district. Today, we'll be voting on another 114 affordable units paired with new services that help some of our most vulnerable populations, formerly homeless seniors. The 1490 Southern Boulevard project will bring 114, 100% affordable res residents for seniors, including a 30% set aside for formerly homeless seniors, 20% more than the, than the mandatory minimum. The remaining of the units will be available for up to 50% AMI. I would like to thank Type A developers for their partnership on this project and bringing in key groups to offer much needed programs in my community. I'm excited that the Jewish Association Serving the Aging will provide on-site supportive services for my seniors and thrilled that the LGBT network will be opening a ground floor community center, partnering with local LGBTQ leaders and groups to ensure that the LGBTQ community in the Bronx can seek high quality services in their own borough. And a big thank you to the land use team for all of their time and efforts on these projects. And I urge my colleagues on this committee to be, uh, please vote uh, yes on this exciting project. Thank you. We'll also be voting to on um, land use item 67, the Paul Robeson Houses and Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan. HPD seeks approval of a partial Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years pursuant to Section 577 of the Private Housing Finance Law. Subject property includes two buildings totaling 81 units that are fully occupied in HDFC. Roberts Ropes and Apartments HDFC will acquire fee interest in the exemption area in the 1990 ACP. Junior Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard LLC will acquire the beneficial interest and will operate the exemption area. The HDFC will provide necessary repairs to the building upon acquisition. This is supported with a uh, letter by Council Member Perkins. We will be voting on to approve on item. <coughs> We will be voting on land use item 69, the Archer Green tax exemption application for property located in Council Member Miller's district in Queens. HPD seeks approval of an Article 11 tax exemption for a term of 40 years. Archer Green Apartments Housing Development Fund Corporation, HDFC, would acquire the property in Archer Green Apartments LP, a limited liability partnership, would be the owner and operator of the property. Collectively, these two organizations will acquire and construct the property with loans from uh, HDC and HPD and with low-income housing tax credits, the owner would enter into a regulatory agreement with HPD to establish controls on the operation of the property. Approval would facilitate a mixed-use building with a residential tower above a base with commercial and community facility uses. The residential tower is expected to include 387 affordable units. The property is currently occupied by an existing two-story parking garage utilized by the NYPD. A parking facility for the NYPD will be included in the pro's development. Uh, this item is supported by Council Member Miller. Last, we'll be voting on land use item 64, the 1618 Fulton Street tax exemption application for property located 
In Councilmember Cornegie's district in Brooklyn, HPD seeks an amendment to a previously approved urban development action area project and approval of an Article 11 tax exemption for property located at 1612, 1624 Fulton Street. The original 1618 Fulton Street application included designation, disposition, and project approval of an urban development action project in order to dispose of three small city-owned lots to be merged with five privately owned lots to assemble a site for development of a 100% affordable housing project financed by HPD's M2 term sheet. This application was approved by the City Council in August 2017. This application seeks Council approval for a 40-year Article 11 tax exemption and an amendment of the previously approved project to adjust the distribution of affordable units. The amended project will include rents affordable to uh, families uh, and uh, the uh, reduction is to 120% of AMI instead of a previously approved uh, 130 percent of AMI. I will now call a vote in accordance with the recommendations of the local council members to approve land use items 64, 65, 67, and 69. Uh, council, please call the roll. Kalos. Aye and all. Deutsch. Uh, so, can I explain my vote? Okay. So, um, I will vote aye and all um, on all these uh, and all these um, uh, bills. And I just want to mention for the record that as chair of the Veterans uh, Committee in the New York City Council, that I'm determined to continue fighting for our homeless veterans. And any time that there is an HPD project or a senior, a senior housing project, that there must be a set aside for homeless veterans. And I will not give up until all 450 plus homeless veterans are in support of housing, and uh, and I had conversations uh, with the chair of land use. Uh, who I will be working uh, together with him on making sure that, that there, there there are set asides for uh, homeless veterans. And if not for our veterans, we probably wouldn't be here today. And we owe uh, we owe everything to to the veterans uh, who protect us each and every day. Thank you. Diaz. Of course. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to, as a veteran myself, I would like to congratulate my colleague for his uh, effort in getting us veterans taken care of. And at the same time, I would like to congratulate my chairman of the Land Use Committee, Rafael Salamanca, because he's, uh, he's been doing a tremendous job. As a chair of this committee, he's been able to push for many projects throughout the city, and especially in his district. So I'm proud of you, Rafael Salamanca. You are making us all feel proud, and congratulations, uh, Mr. Chair. I vote yes on all. The land use items are approved by a vote of three in the affirmative, zero negative, and no abstentions, and referred to the full land use committee for consideration. We will now open a public hearing on land use item 71, the two buildings tenants united HDFC application for a UDF, UDAP approvals and an article 11 tax exemption for property located at 280 East 3rd Street and 230 East 4th Street in Council Member uh, Carlina Rivera's district in Manhattan. The properties are two six-story multiple dwellings with 36 rental units. All units are fully occupied and targeted to households at 60 to 80 percent of AMI. Currently, there is no exemption provided from real property taxation and significant er tax arrears. To preserve the rental affordability and prevent tenant displacement while also addressing the retroactive tax burden, the current owners will transfer the deed to the city, who will then, free and clear of taxes, convey the property to two buildings, Tenants United Housing Development Fund Company and HDFC. Under the new regulatory agreement, the HDFC will preserve and rehabilitate such buildings and continue to provide affordable rent-stabilized units. I'll now turn it to uh, Council Member Carlina Rivera to make a statement. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Kalos and the committee. I was here. <clears throat> so thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the application for UDAP approvals and the Article 11 tax exemption for 280 East 3rd Street and 230 East 4th Street, located in Council District 2. Since their renovation in the late 1980s through an HPD program, these buildings have remained affordable housing options for 36 families. Unfortunately, 
Due to construction overruns and certificate of occupancy issues, J51 tax exemption deadlines were missed early in the process, resulting in a higher than expected tax burden accumulating over time. This financial burden is now at a level that modern income tenants could never afford to cover given ongoing maintenance and operating costs. Today we have an opportunity to allow these buildings to avoid a tax lien sale and remain affordable. Ownership would be transferred via the city, as mentioned by Chairman Kalos, from the current deed holder to Two Building Tenants United Housing Development Company Incorporated, an entity established by the Cooper Square HDFC Community Land Trust. Cooper Square is one of the oldest community land trusts in the country, with a strong reputation in my district and the city at large. It has become a model for a type of ownership structure that is gaining steam in our city. Together with the ownership transfer under the land trust, the UDAP approvals and the Article 11 exemption before you will eliminate the extreme tax burden, making the buildings operationally affordable for the tenants who are never at fault for the current state of affairs. With the guidance and expertise of Cooper Square, tenants on the board will be empowered to manage their building after hitting important benchmarks. Therefore, to preserve affordability and to put the destiny of 280 East 3rd Street and 230 East 4th Street in the hands of tenants and a trusted community partner, please approve this conveyance and tax exemption. I also want to thank HPD for their assistance and of course Cooper Square for your innovation your pioneering history on the CLT movement and for everything you do for affordable housing tenants. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Kalos. We'll now reopen the roll on the items for vote. Gibson. I vote aye. The land use items are approved by a vote of four in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions and referred to the full land use committee. like to now call up uh, uh, Devin from HPD, uh, James from HPD, Nancy, and uh, Lacey. If you can. Do, do we know who is testifying on two bridges from HPD specifically? So whoever is testifying, if you could sit down, state your name, and we will uh, we will take your affirmations. We will also call up uh, Nikki as well as uh, Valerio. Perfect. Um, could everyone on the panel please um, state your name and raise your right hand? Please state your names. Uh, make sure your microphone the mic is on, please. Into the mic. Do, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I affirm. Yes. If each person could just state your name for the stenographer. James Leba, HPD. Lacey Tauber, HPD. Nancy Solomon, HPD. Nikki Tizmanakis, Goldstein Hall. Valerio Orselli, uh, Cooper Square Community Land Trust. I'm going to uh, turn the hearing over briefly to uh, Councilmember Rivera for the uh, public testimony, and then I will be right back. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. We're all ready now. You're set? All right. All right. 
Okay. Land use, item number 71, uh, consists of two fully occupied multiple dwellings located at 280 East 3rd Street and 280 East 4th Street, known as Two Buildings Tenants United in Manhattan Council District 2. Um, thank you for being here, Council Member Rivera. The city conveyed the disposition area in 1991, together with seven other properties, to the People's Mutual Housing Association of the Lower East Side Incorporated, which changed its corporate name in 1995 to the Lower East Side People's Mutual Housing Association, Inc., the current owner, for an affordable housing project developed under the Lower East Side Cross-Subsidy Program. The program was the product of an agreement between HPD and Manhattan Community Board 3, and was designed to maintain affordable housing, which used a revolving fund that would subsidize the development of permanently affordable housing for low- and middle-income residents of the neighborhood, rehabilitating vacant multifamily buildings owned by the city, as well as constructing new multifamily buildings on the Lower East Side. The buildings comprise 36 units, with a mixture of unit types, including four studios, seven one-bedrooms, nine two-bedrooms, 12 three-bedrooms, and three four-bedroom apartments, as well as a superintendent's unit. Household incomes are below 80% of AMI. HPD provided mortgage financing for the rehabilitation of the two multiple dwellings in 1991, and the current owner entered into a regulatory agreement with HPD to provide housing for persons of low income and the homeless for 99 years. The disposition area was expected to receive J51 tax exemptions, but the exemptions never took effect due to delays in obtaining permanent certificates of occupancy. As a result, significant tax arrears have accrued on the two properties, thus endangering the viability of the project. In order to eliminate the arrears, the current owner will deliver deeds in lieu of foreclosure for the properties to the city. In turn, the city will convey the properties to two buildings, Tenants United Housing Development Fund Company, Inc., free and clear of taxes. The two buildings, Tenants United HGFC, will convey the exemption area, but not the improvements, the buildings, to Cooper Square Housing Development Fund Company Community Land Trust, CLT. Two Buildings Tenants United will assume a portion of the city's 1991 mortgage and together with the Scooper, sorry, <laughs> Cooper Square Housing Development Fund Company Community Land Trust, Inc. will enter into a new regulatory agreement establishing certain controls upon the operation of the disposition area. The buildings are in fair to good shape and will only need general maintenance upon transfer of ownership. In order to help preserve long-term affordability of the low-income rental units, HPD is before the Planning Subcommittee seeking approval of Article 11 tax benefits for a period of 40 years that will coincide with the term of the regulatory agreement. Thank you. Is anyone else going to testify from your team? Everybody's just here to answer questions. Okay, so I have a few questions. Um, so what is the term of the regulatory agreement associated with the transaction? Um, it's 40 years. Can we get Nancy like a little closer to the mic? <laughs> you answer the question. Yeah, it's 40, 40 years. years. <laughs> Great. So, and the net present value of the tax exemption for the project? Um, it's approximately 3.7 million. So will current tenants be able to stay, well, you alluded to this in your testimony that it's the exemption and not the actual buildings themselves, but will the tenants be able to stay in their homes and will rents for the current tenants change? The tenants will be able to stay in their homes and they'll be paying the same rent after the transfer of ownership. That's required for the terms of the regulatory agreement, um, which we'll finalize in the fall. And I know you alluded also to the AMI, but what are the affordability restrictions of the vacant units and how were they determined? So the maximum rents would be affordable to households earning up to 80% AMI. And I, I mentioned this in my testimony, but if you could talk a little bit about, um, give a very, I guess, brief history of the tax arrears and why they're so high. Um, so there were some construction delays um, that prevented uh, the buildings from receiving their certi certificates of occupancy, um, which then in turn prevented them from accessing the J-51 tax abatements, as I mentioned in the testimony. Um, so they got the CFOs in 2012. Um, I think maybe the folks in involved can speak a little more to that if you would like to. Oh yeah, and Mr. Orselli, if you don't mind going into a little bit about uh, Cooper Square and your history managing some of the tenants, sure. and then the, the CLT project and how these buildings will add to the model that you've created citywide. Yeah, um, I'm gonna try to condense a long history in a I few know, words. I know, that's why I'm telling you <laughs> concise, because I know the history is long and complex and beautiful. Sure. 
Cooper Square, uh, Cooper Square Mutual Land Trust was formed about the same time as the Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association by a parent organization, the Cooper Square Committee, which is the oldest anti-displacement organization in New York City. Uh, this was after our alternate plan for Cooper Square was only partly adopted. There was lack of federal funding. At our insistence, we had requested that the housing remain standing and occupied by low-income people in the 70s and by homeless families in the 80s. And now we were stuck with 21 buildings that needed uh, really to be torn down and built anew, and there was no, mon no money for that. So we had to put together a revised plan for Cooper Square that spoke about uh, renovation of the buildings. And I'm not going to go into what was offered as a quid pro quo to the city, the new construction, mixed income. Um, but essentially, the city agreed to our plan after a few years of negotiations, and they asked us to, to decide what city plan uh, should we adopt to renovate these buildings. In those days, you had uh, uh, homesteading, you had community management, you had till program. We looked at them all, and we found them all to be inadequate because the end result were going to be, whether paid in full by the city or partly, single building co-ops of 15 to 20 tenants of very low income that push comes to shove when a new roof is going to be needed at the end of their useful life for a new boiler, the tenants could not have afforded. So we basically developed two or three major concepts. One, we sought to create an economy of scale by bringing buildings together. In the case of Cooper Square MHA, 21 buildings. In the case of these two buildings, it's two buildings together. Uh, smaller scale, but we're hoping to increase at some future time. That helped to address the issue about uh, keeping costs down by creating an economy of scale, the purchase of fuel, insurance, services, at a discounted price. The other problem had to do with what is something, something very common in HDSC co-ops, and that is the lack of real accountability. Um, the co-op board uh, does, not, does not like to raise the maintenance fees, so they can't afford to pay for major repairs. Uh, they don't pay the taxes sometimes, not just uh, real estate, but water and sewer taxes. The bill is not properly maintained. So we'll create a new entity, which is a Cooper Square Community Land Trust, to serve as a steward over the affordable housing. And that means that, unlike other city programs, which has sometimes very strict regulatory agreements, enforcement mortgages, uh, deeds, um, which are all pieces of paper, okay? They have a certain value, but there's no enforcement mechanism. A piece of paper does not enforce itself. So we felt that we needed to do an innovative thing, which is to, to separate ownership of the buildings from ownership of the land, uh, give the ownership of the buildings, as we're doing today, to the HDFC, but retain ownership of the land and by virtue of owning the land, um, executing a ground lease between the HDFC and the Cooper Square Community Land Trust, which gives the HDFC the power to monitor conditions in the buildings, to have not merely a piece of paper between the two buildings, but actual representation on the boards of the HDFC, to help to govern and also help to direct them in the right directions, putting together a, a renovation plan when time comes for that, uh, trying to get better deals with insurance or whatever. And um, if they really fall afoul of the different agreements, uh, the, the, the COT has the power to intervene and remove the board, appoint new members on a temporary basis to bring them back into compliance. That addresses the issues about governance. It addresses the issue of um, the responsibility of the board. And uh, it serves as a fail-safe. It also serves as a deterrent to speculation, because if anyone tries to sell an apartment, they're not going to be able to provide the buyer with a clear title. By doing so, some 24 years after we were created, our buildings remain very affordable, in very good condition, managed by the Cooper Square MHA, owned by a co-op, the Cooper Square Mutual Housing Association, and we have um, exceeded our goals. Our legal requirements, the housing be affordable to families at 80% of AMI or below. Our internal goal, in case some behemoth like Donald Trump becomes the, the, uh, the president, and there's no more Section 8, our housing will remain affordable to families at 50% of AMI. Current affordability is between 26 and 36% of AMI. So we believe we have a model which is now being copied around the city, and we hope to see it expanding and we have groups information in all the five boroughs at the present time. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. So I think this is an incredibly important program. I, I want to thank HPD again. I want to thank you, Val, and, and, and Cooper Square for being here. Um, I have no further questions at this time. I don't see any other council members here to ask questions. So if you have any other further statements, we can move on to the next panel. Yeah? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Val. Thank you for all that you do. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak on this land use item? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing. Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on this item. Thank you. Um, we did ask if there was too much steering because we can't That's fine. So the next hearing will be on land use item 68, the Bethany Place application for a 40-year tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law for property located at 301 West 153rd Street, 2091 Frederick Douglass Boulevard in Council Member Perkins District in Manhattan. The subject property is an existing 23-unit building. The building, which already receives a full tax exemption, is fully occupied in current tenant's income range from 70 to 80 percent AMI. Vacant units will be income restricted, including five units at 100 percent AMI and 18 units at 130 percent AMI. Extension of the term of the Article 11 tax exemption is necessary in order to match the life of the first position loan from HDC. I now open up the public hearing on this item. Please state your names for the record. Lacey Tauber, HPD. Jeremy Hoffman, HPD. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. Okay. Uh, land use item number 68 consists of an exemption area containing one multiple dwelling located at 301 West 143rd Street and one vacant lot located at 2091 Frederick Del Douglas Boulevard and is known as Bethany Place. Uh, Bethany 2 Housing Development Fund Corporation is the owner and operates the exemption area, which provides rental housing for low-income families. On April 14th, 2003, Resolution 821, you want me to pause, I can, you want me to hold? No problem. Okay. On April 14th, 2003, Resolution 821, the City Council approved the disposition of three contiguous vacant and gutted city-owned tenements to the sponsor, Bethany 2 Housing Development Fund Corporation. In 1996, the sponsor purchased the adjacent lot um, through a lien sale, and together both lots make up the project area. The project was redeveloped under HDC's mixed income program, which restricts incomes between um, up to 130% AMI. There are 10 two bedrooms and 13 three bedroom apartments for a total of 23 units. In accordance with program guidelines and the HDC regulatory agreement, of the 23 units, five units are income restricted at 100% AMI, and 18 units are income restricted at 130% AMI. Work on the building began in 2004, but delays in construction led to the eventual replacement of the general contractor, as well as increased costs. In 2010, the City Council approved a 32-year Article 11 tax exemption that took effect in 2012, with the closing on additional construction financing. Because of the construction delays, the final certificate of occupancy was not issued until 2016. The project is now fully rented. Currently, the sponsor is preparing for the construction loan conversion to permanent financing. HDC has agreed to provide additional financing and to extend its first position loan term to 35 years and its subordinate loans to, 30 to 43 years. Excuse me. Given HDC requires extension of the Article 11 tax exemption for the life of its first position loan, the Article 11 tax exemption provided in 2010 needs to be terminated and replaced by a new 40-year Article 11 tax exemption coinciding with new regulatory agreements. Additionally, the sponsor and HTC have agreed to extend the affordability restrictions for 43 years from 2018. For this reason, the existing HDC regulatory agreement will be amended and restated to extend to 2061, which is beyond the extended term of the first position loan and the new Article 11 exemption. The owner has financed the acquisition and rehabilitation of the exemption area with loans from the New York City Housing Development Corporation, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and the Community Preservation Corporation, and grants from the State of New York. 
The owner and HPD will enter into a regulatory agreement establishing certain controls upon the operation of the exemption area. In order to ensure the continued affordability of the exemption area, HPD is before the subcommittee seeking approval of a new Article 11 tax exemption. Thank you. I want to thank my colleague, Councilmember Rivera, for uh, taking over briefly during the uh, two uh, buildings uh, meeting. Uh, what is the uh, value of the Article 11 tax exemption? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm being corrected. <laughs> I think I gave the address wrong. It's 143rd? 153rd. I said 143rd. It's 153rd. I'm sorry. Misspoke. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> what is the value of the tax exemption uh, over the life of the exemption as well as however you may value it for this year? Um, I have the net present value um, of the tax exemption. Um, what does it just say? Net present. Okay, the net present value is approximately 2.1 million. Do you have the uh, full cost over the life of the abatement? We'll have to get back to you, Council Member. Perfect. Is it possible that it might be 7.4 million? That is entirely possible. Perfect. Was that, was that provided to you previously? I believe so. <laughs> uh, are th is this project receiving any additional subsidies? It's receiving a subsidized loan from HPD. Uh, okay. And uh, what is the value of the uh, subsidized loan? It's, I believe, a total of approximately $2.4 million. And is that a no interest loan until the uh, a balloon date, or what is the? That, that is correct. It's a well. There's an interest rate on it uh, that is it will be payable or accrued to a balloon payment. And is there also HDC financing? Um, yes, HDC is providing the first mortgage financing, and they're also providing a subordinate uh, subsidy loan that will have a balloon payment at the maturity as well after 43 years. And how much is that? The balloon payment? Uh, the or HDC the first mortgage. Uh, the HDC first mortgage is approximately $4 million. The is there any other HPD or HDC uh, funding? Um, the, the total funding is the, uh, the HPD subsidy I already mentioned, the HDC first mortgage loan, and then the HDC subordinate loan of about approximately $500,000. How much? $500,000, which is mainly accrued interest that's being turned into a, a note. So that's existing debt that's just being floated as a new, it's existing interest that is owed on the property. Construction interest, exactly. Sorry, give me one moment. Uh, and uh, additionally, there was a, a New York State grant of around approximately $1.4 million as well that went in at the beginning, the beginning of the financing in 2004. Okay, give me one moment, that is a, a new one. And the grant was how much again, sorry? Uh, approximately $1.4 million. Uh, is there LIHTC on this? No, there is not. Okay, uh, so I guess the, the first piece, and as I'm getting to see more and more projects, I'm, I'm a systems person, so different projects uh, ha are in different situations, but so based on your testimony, so construction starts in 2004, and then it isn't completed until 2016. Can you explain what caused the lengthy del delay in this project? Uh, whether or not there are similar projects with existing delays and how HPD is avoiding this in the future. Sure. Um, after construction commenced, there were structural and facade components of the existing building that were found to be structurally unsound. Um, there were also additional, as a result of that, 
uh, materials that were needed. Um, the general contractor filed for change orders, but the cost increases became excessive and, and the contractor ultimately was removed. Um, that contractor filed a mechanics lien that led to litigation, which significantly delayed construction truly starting in earnest. Um, the, the litigation lasted for, uh, for some time, um, after which when that was settled, a new GC was brought in and the plans were refiled with DOB. Um, at that point, DOB uh, found that the plans were not compliant with zoning, so there had to be additional changes to it. Um, at that point, the project was redesigned, resubmitted to the Department of Buildings, and construction began in 2012, and construction completed in 2014. They got their TCO in that moment, um, and, and they got final TCO in 2016. So, the, so there were significant issues that were unexpected um, as part of the initial project that had to be resolved, and there was litigation until ultimately the construction could, could truly commence, and then it was about a two-year process. Is there, is there any current HPD site where the funding has been lined up um, and for whatever reason construction has not started within 365 days? Uh, meaning anything that's been financed uh, recently? I'm like in the- in At all? Uh, there's another similar project um, on Amclay and Bal Boulevard that was in 2006 and that also just completed construction in terms of the preservation projects that I'm aware of, those are the, the two that are in this position. There was a project uh, that we heard about, I'd say a couple of weeks ago, where there were vacant empty lots. Uh, and in that case, it appeared that they were just empty lots, but they were owned by somebody who was in the private sector. Uh, are there any adjacent vacant lots to this development uh, what outreach have you taken if there are, and uh, why is it not part of this development, and what is the story with any vacant lots? Yes, Council Member. Uh, there, as a part of this project, there is a, a vacant lot owned by the HDFC adjacent to these buildings. Uh, it's about 25 feet wide, um, so a little bit difficult to develop in of itself. However, there is a additional adjacent lot that is owned by another party other than the church. Um, that they're in conversations with about joining, uh, creating a joint partnership and to redevelop it as affordable housing together. Um, it is HPD's uh, strong desire to support them in that effort and conversations are ongoing. The width of the lot is 25 feet. What is the depth of the lot? Uh, 100. 100 feet. 25 by 100 would be one of the larger uh, lots in the city. Uh, I, I used to do a lot of work in, 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 in Harlem in terms of brownstones and you've got buildings that are 12 feet wide, so 25 is, is a double wide. It's a standard New York City lot size, but I mean, I think, you know, if, if we're able to access the lot next door as well, you know, we could do something even bigger and better. So, you know, I think that would be ideal for us. So, so that is the reason it is not currently moving forward? Uh, I would have to get back to you on, on the specific reason that construction is not underway, but my understanding from the gentleman from Bethany Church is that they're int very interested in developing the site and in active conversations. Uh, has HPD explored using eminent domain to take that site for affordable housing? We have not. Has, has HPD used eminent domain in the past four and a half years to build any affordable housing? I'm, I'm not aware. I'm not aware, but um, we, can, we can get back to you. I think, I mean, I, I would love to sit down with the commissioner and or the mayor to yeah, just. Yeah, maybe this is something that we can we can have a separate conversation about. I think for this project, you know, the the project before you today is a is a preservation project. Um, it's having a conversation about new construction is something we also want to do, but we want to you know that would be a whole separate and completely different project than this one. Fair enough. It's just we're using we're disposing of city land for a dollar to folks, but it would be nice to acquire land for the city for uh, whatever we're legally allowed to under eminent domain so we can build affordable housing. Uh, I th the income restrictions on this project are 100% of AMI to 130% of AMI, uh, which are much higher than the current tenants at 70 to 80% of AMI. Can you explain the rationale behind these higher income restrictions? Yeah, the, the current rents are between 70 and 80% of AMI. I'm not personally aware of the exact incomes of the households that are living there today. 
Um, the, the income uh, restrictions at 130% 100, of AMI are consistent with the HDC program under which this was financed. Um, and, and as a part of this project, those uh, restrictions are being extended out. Um, the, I will note that the representatives from the church said that the uh, units are being rented to people within the community that really need affordable housing. Um, and, and I believe that, yeah. And, and moving forward, if somebody is interested in these units, do they have to, do they go through HPD or do they go through the church? They go through the church. They go through, actually, these, these are, these are, they go through HDC, right? It's not, but it's not HDC that is renting the units. They're rented by the church. But they follow the guidelines. Right, they follow the HDC and HPD marketing guidelines for marketing of the units and filling them with tenants. Okay, so we, we passed a, a local law that was originally introduction 1015, moving forward, anything that's financed by the city or HPD is supposed to go through the city's housing portal so that we have it all in one place. So I guess the That's question is whether or not it will be on Housing Connect or whether it will be on HDC's version or whether folks will have to call the church. No, they don't call the church, yeah. <laughs> this is, um, it would be on HDC's, yeah. Right, the management company does the advertising for HDC. Okay, Gracious so guidelines. if H before the next hearing, if HPD can get back on compliance with introduction 1015. Right, I mean, I know we're working on that. We're, I know we're working on that right now. All right, fair enough. Uh, in terms of this site, will there be any work done on the site? All the construction is already completed. Are there any open violations? No. Uh, the construction work that occurred, was it done by people who received health, disability, or pension benefits? I would have to go back to them, I can't remember. Uh, the site, as it's being currently operated, do the people operating the site have health, disability, or pension benefits? I would similarly have to go back to them, I can't remember. Uh, was there any participation by minority and women-owned businesses uh, in the construction of this project? Is that of the contractor? The, the church, as it says, but the contractor is MWB. Fair, fair enough. Um, was there a local hire requirement to target and was that met? I believe that this project was constructed prior. Oh, we would have to go back to you on that as well. Okay. Uh, let me uh, call up Stephen Robinson, who is also signed up to testify from. Uh, sh sure. So if I can call up Stephen Robinson, who signed up to testify, who does not necessarily yeah, need to testify, but <laughs> <laughs> some of the questions that uh, HPD was not able to answer. So I, I think just, uh, if, if you can state your name for the record. I'm Stephen Robinson from Bethany Baptist Church. Sure, so uh, I guess if you can shed some light on I think there's a lot of interest from the city council and likely from your council member, Bill Perkins, to get this additional uh, empty lot uh, developed as part of this project or as part of a subsequent pro project. What can we do at the city council? What can HPD do better? What can HDC do better to get you the financing to build with the 25 by 100 that you have or support the negotiations with the private party? Uh, what's happening now, there, there are two lots side by side. Uh, both of them are 25 by 100. Uh, when we were looking at um, building with this project, it became uh, not feasible because of the, uh, the fact that we would have to, in order to build at the same le height of these buildings, it would have required, um, um, the difficulty was that we wouldn't have been uh, able to make the same height uh, and the setback, it would require a setback and the 100 feet, 30 of that in the back would have been, um, 30 feet of that would have been taken away. So it just made it impossible to work with it for this particular project. The fact that we have a, a second lot next to it that's 25 by 100 also would enable us to build a uh, much taller structure with, um, to provide more, more housing for additional people. So we are looking at that and we've been, we've been in negotiations uh, with the owner 
the owner was originally a um, gentleman named Shop who had inherited the property from his father who um, uh, this took a long time to negotiate a, a figure with them and uh, so that it, it bypassed, we bypassed him to go ahead and get this project done with the hopes that we would be able to um, follow through with this project. We are quite interested in uh, doing um, this, these, this building next to it, the present building, and we um, will certainly be uh, speaking with the people at HPD to um, give us an assistance in terms of making sure that we're able to go forth with that as well. Does HPD provide assistance with the acquisition for nonprofits? Uh, as a part of the, the financing, we are would include acquisition in the overall development budget. Is that the question? So we, we've got a existing partner on an existing project with an empty lot that was, I believe, originally part of the project that is now an out lot from the project and an empty lot nearby. So I just want to make sure that I, I, I haven't seen the, the, the books for this uh, faith-based institution or nonprofit, but uh, generally folks having the, the closing costs necessary and what have you to closing costs and down payment and, 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 and to purchase the land can be difficult. So is HPD committed to supporting them and working with them to get this piece of land acquired? Yes, absolutely. There, there's uh, two things I would say in response to that. One is that we, uh, a year and a half ago, came out with an owner's rep RFQ specifically for faith-faith organizations to get uh, consultants that can provide assistance in terms of the process aspect of it. Um, and there also is the New York City Acquisition Loan Fund that a nonprofit can get very, very favorable financing for that includes costs for, for acquisition and pre-development. Um, and, and that would all be folded into the ultimate HPD financing for a new construction project. So what, what additional uh, funding might be available if the faith-based institution was interested in doing supportive housing on site? Uh, I, I apologize, I don't work in the supportive housing, so I can't opine on that. Work I on mean, they would be able to access financing options that were specific to supportive housing, um, the supportive housing loan uh, program, et cetera. So, I mean, there, we would look at all different kinds of opportunities for a new site. And does your institution feel supported by HPD and HDC to move forward on this additional site? Uh, yes, we do. And in fact, uh, not only that, we um, have the uh, support and ear of um, the assemblyman from the uh, state that's in place now, um, Assemblyman um, Al Taylor, who's taking the place of Assemblyman Farrell, who um, have always had a kind of close relationship. In fact, those grants uh, were initiated um, that we received early on in the project from uh, Councilman um, Farrell, and we have that same relationship hopefully with uh, Al Taylor. D Denny is a good friend. Uh, so I guess how long can I expect to have Bethany back uh, with HPD on this, uh, these two lots? I, I don't think we can answer that right now, <laughs> but we'll keep you in the loop. We weeks, course. months, years, terms, decades, generations. I mean, it really depends on the outcome of the negotiations with the, with the owner of the adjacent property, but you know, we're, we're going to be engaged actively in these conversations. And I, I know you'll continue to ask us and we'll continue to report back. And, and, and you'll call me if, if HPD <laughs> or HDC is I, not. I appreciate your <laughs> <laughs> No worries. Absolutely. Okay. And then I asked a couple of questions about how the project was developed and whether or not the workers who did the work building it or the workers who are now maintaining it have health insurance, disability insurance, and an ability to retire. Uh, certainly all of the people that now um, work for the project uh, do have those benefits, Great. Um, and um, uh, they are very, uh, uh, we, we try to keep them because we are also uh, a church in the community, we, uh, religious base, we uh, also try to keep them um, uh, happy. We're not trying to make money in, in the sense of um, walking away with, uh, you know, a, a lot of money. We just want to make sure that we have affordable housing for Mm -hmm. uh, our people that live in that community. And do you, can you share how many of the people who built the building or currently work in the new development 
or, or now at this point slightly older development, but th mm -hmm. as, as it goes, uh, we're hired from the neighborhood and local community versus from other places? Uh, I don't have an exact number, but I can tell you that if you go into the construction and uh, presently now there's a, uh, a good percentage of people that have uh, either lived in the community, a few of them actually that even from from our congregation uh, that are uh, been able to um, secure um, positions uh, there. Um, we also have a uh, 202 senior housing that is uh, in, at an adjacent property to the two lots uh, that are in between us and uh, this 202 housing, we were, uh, we're very happy that we provided senior housing uh, both to our church and to the neighborhood. Uh, and um, it, uh, it's been really a beacon in that community that we are able to provide affordable housing. As you know, the community is constantly changing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our only, um, my only grief about all of this is that we weren't able to uh, purchase and or participate in more affordable housing early on. Yeah. Great. And uh, can you just reflect in terms of the people who are doing the work, the people who are currently doing the work, how many of the companies were owned and operated by minorities and women business enterprises and uh, of the folks, how many folks actually ended up getting those jobs and just were those jobs just minimum wage jobs or were they paid at a higher rate that was like other built projects in the neighborhood? Uh, I can tell you that um, I, I don't have any um, good numbers to, today. I probably could give you those in a short time. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the, um, the numbers, but I can tell you that um, uh, from, from knowing the people, it, the fact that it's a, they are small enough projects that I can uh, tell you that, um, for example, the, for our security, often we use uh, the youth that are there in the community, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, those are kind of um, what we call um, start out of jobs that they are able to work and go to school and, uh, you know, further their education while they're uh, also providing service for the community to provide, provide them a, uh, a springboard to uh, get better jobs and uh, continue their education. Uh, in terms of the seniors, we have a senior program we use. Um, uh, seniors also from, uh, what is, I'm trying to think of the name of the group that we, East, uh, East of Seal that uh, come in and work uh, uh, during the day at the housing project and, uh, and help to do the filing and get all of the paperwork together for people that are uh, applying for the position. And then uh, we have um, um, uh, people that have been there a long time, other people that have worked on other projects of ours that have moved on to this project uh, in which they have been, uh, I, as you said, very happy with what we've been able to do. Uh, thank you very much. Please rest assured that uh, a lot of the questions that I asked you today are things that I ask of everyone who comes before this committee. and. For consistency's sake, I thought it was important that I also ask you, so uh, I appreciate the great work that you're doing, and I am eager to see more affordable housing built. If you're interested in supportive housing, I'm trying to build as much of it in my district as possible. Happy to work with you there, too, uh, and, and thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to testify on this item? Uh, seeing none, I will uh, close the, I will excuse this panel and close the hearing on this Thank item. you, Council Member. I will now open the public hearing on land use item 72, the CSH application for a 40 year tax exemption pursuant to article 11 for property located at 752 McDonough Street and 1638 Broadway in Councilmember Amphrey Samuels District in Brooklyn. These two buildings are part of a 32 building corporation for supportive housing portfolio that entered into a new regulatory agreement with HPD in 2015. The Article 11 tax exemption for those two buildings would place different type of tax exemption, a 420C that was erroneously applied. The exemption will last 35 years from 2015 and be coterminous with a new regulatory agreement. I'd like to now ask the uh, 
panel to turn on the microphones and state your names for the record, and then I will ask the uh, committee council to uh, give you the affirmation. Lacey Tauber, HPD. Seth Bynum, HPD. Uh, Devin Neary, HPD. Margarita Bajado, CB Emanuel Roper. Do you each swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> I can't see you. Here. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, land use uh, number 72 consists of an exemption area containing two fully occupied buildings located at 752 McDonough Street and w 1638 Broadway in Brooklyn Council District 41 and is known as CSH, Community Services Housing Development Corporation. Um, the two buildings were originally conveyed to the owner in 1996 upon approval by the City Council to Ma Mamie Wiggins LP under HPD's Neighborhood Redevelopment Program. As part of a year 15 refinancing repositioning, Mamie Wiggins Limited Partnership buildings were consolidated in a portfolio of 33 buildings and four vacant lots and the closing occurred on December 30th, 2015. At that time, the buildings in the portfolio were owned by five separate partnership entities, all of which were affiliates of CSH and are now under one ownership structure. A full 420C residential tax benefit was expected to run coterminous with the new financing, but it was discovered during the tax credit application process that two subject buildings did not receive tax credits as part of their prior financing and were not eligible to receive the 420C exemption. In order to ensure the continued financial sustainability and extended affordability of this project, HPD is seeking a full Article 11 tax exemption uh, for LU number 72 retroactive from 2015. The owner will enter into a regulatory agreement that will be coterminous with the 35-year Article 11 tax exemption. Thank you. Uh, give me one moment. Uh, Windows is amazing and it resets on you and <laughs> updates without permission. So I'm just trying to pull up my items. Can you explain the ownership and management structure of the 32 building portfolio that these two buildings are part of? And uh, how does CSH relate to CB Emanuel relative to the Lavagna Avenue HDFC? Uh, following the chain of sponsors, owners, partners, and subsidiaries can be difficult for portfolios like this. Currently, currently, the beneficial owner is a CBCSH 2015 LLC. Uh, They're a subsidiary of uh, CB Emanuel Realty, the sponsor, as well as Shinda Management Corporation. The LLC in question is, is uh, currently in entered with a uh, nominee agreement with Livonia HDFC Incorporated. This application requests an Article 11 tax exemption for two properties of a 32 property portfolio, the rest of which are receiving a, sorry, it's a, uh, sorry, um, is it 32 or 33 buildings? It's a 33 buildings. Okay. We clarified that and updated the project summary. Yes. Great. So this application requests an Article 11 tax exemption for two properties of a 33 property portfolio, the rest of which are receiving 420C tax exemption, Article 11 and 420C are both full residential tax exemptions. Explain the difference between the two and when they are used and why the 420C could not apply here. So uh, 420C tax exemptions, uh, the, the rules, there's I think three basic, uh, three basic rules for why, uh, how a 420C uh, tax exemption can be given. 
One of them, in this case, which the uh, two properties did not meet, was that the building, the two buildings in question are either formally received tax credits or are trying to receive tax credits. The other 31 buildings in the portfolio all received tax credits. And initially in 1996, when, as, as what was said by our colleague here, uh, the tax credits were awarded uh, to, the, to the entire portfolio. But in terms of uh, at completion, they realized that not all the tax credits were actually used on the building because it just wasn't need. Co costs for con construction were a little bit lower than we thought. Uh, so as it turns out, those two buildings currently in question were trying to get an Article 11 for. Uh, no tax credit funds were used on those buildings. Therefore, those, those buildings technically did not receive tax credit funds and therefore are not uh, eligible for 420C tax exemption. So in the testimony, I noticed there are four vacant lots. Can you tell me a little bit about the four vacant lots? I'm going to let my colleague here from CB Emanuel speak to this. Sure. And so, so this is, so we have 37 lots in total? Yes. Hi. Uh, the, the vacant lots um, are behind a series of buildings um, on Eastern Parkway, I believe. And they're awkwardly shaped. They're not very... Um, amenable to new construction unless we um, purchase uh, contiguous lots uh, that are currently privately owned. So because these lots were originally part of the original HPD mortgage, uh, they were just rolled into, um, t into the deal to not, to not bifurcate them and, and it was just a, an issue of simplicity. We, they, we can build upon them if we do acquire uh, private lots where we're not in a position right now to, to plan for that because we still haven't converted this, this deal. And so that's a phase two down the road if, you know, if feasible. Back to HPD, the question being, this is the second project you're coming to me with today with vacant lots on it this is a project going back to 2015, so it's been three years under this very administration. Uh, can we talk about the vacant lots and how we can get those built into affordable, supportive, or other housing that New Yorkers need? I mean, again, I think for us, this is getting this piece done is the priority, um, and we are happy to circle back um, with the team and talk about um, looking at that as a next step. So 16th, how many separate blocks does this uh, project relate to? So, si it are, so it, this is block 1502 and block 1499? That is correct. Do we know the total number of blocks? And, and I'm not sure we have that. And so the, the <laughs> yeah, we can get that to you. Yeah. Where are the vacant lots? Are they on block 1499 or block 1502? I'm sorry, uh, council member, I guess I misunderstood you. Are you're asking about the blocks for the vacant lots only right now? The, the, the vacant lots are within the full portfolio. Um, we're not necessarily on these two lots that are in question today. Are, are um, the four lots contiguous? Uh, you need to speak into the mic. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I have to confirm this. I believe three are and one is not. Okay, so the three contiguous lots, <laughs> do you know what the addresses would be or where they are? I'm, I'm looking at the, at the blocks in question on Google Maps and they all seem to be fairly developed and I'm not seeing irregular lots. If you, if you look at um, 1484 Eastern Parkway, there are the lots behind that. And one of them are, is, is, is awkwardly shaped almost like a triangle and then the rest are are narrow rectangular lots. Give me one moment. Thank you. That was helpful. I'm just the future is amazing. The fact that you can just 
pull things up and get a view of what they look like. So currently one of the, okay, so it's the lots next to, it's between Eastern Parkway, Hardway, Howard Avenue and Lincoln Place, that, that sounds, block. Yeah, that sounds right. And so you have um, an empty lot between two buildings. Right. And then you have a wraparound that appears to be used for uh, parking. Right. But I Im imagine that you can't really build something necessarily. Oh wow, somebody built something there. Okay. Uh, so you're just so it seems that the lot type that you're dealing with in this neighborhood is being used for like single family two story buildings. Um, so yes, but 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 also higher, three three uh, stories and above also um, are the housing type is the housing typology in the area. Got but it. It's it's mixed. And but I, I I'm not I'm not sure what you're looking at, but what you describe appears to be correct and uh, as far as what is the existing condition there of the lots and um, and like I said without acquisition of a lot behind those lots um, it's really hard to build and it's kind of an alleyway from from my recollection it, it looks like you should be it, it looks like the lot is 20 by about it looks like a 20 by 100 lot I, I don't have the zoning maps pulled up for me but I guess one question is, while we're doing the other development, while you have these vacant lots, uh, would you in be interested in partnering with the local neighborhood association? Uh, one I know of is a 465 acres or something to actually activate the space into something the community can use for planting and gardening or just not just <coughs> leaving a, a vacant lot there, but actually activating it as a community space while you're working to develop it, even if it's with an understanding with folks that this is a four or five year term and after that there will be affordable housing there. We're, we're open to we're open to having those conversations about community benefits um, on, on the vacant land to the extent that there isn't um, uh, a longer term agenda to, to acquire other lots that can make those lots buildable. So to the extent that... So you don't own the adjacent buildings, no, you just... Got it. The, on one we side, own, we you own 1474. So that's a 1474 1484. That's part of this 33 building portfolio. Right, but that is <coughs> a that's a six story building with a right. lot of units, and you're n I doubt you're going to raise that building. No, to no, no, no. So your your goal would be to expend further. To, so there's basically a handful of. There's three buildings between those your building and the corner, and your goal would be to build something larger. Are those buildings being actually activated and used? Are they vacant? What are they being used for? I believe they're being used for residential housing. One of them is an appliance store. The other one is, it looks like single family or so you have one two-story building, then you have a second three-story building, and then on the vacant lot that you have, there's a, according to Google, there's a for sale sign on it. I mean, Councilman, we can we can have a separate meeting about this if you like. I mean, I think well, the idea today is so to make sure that these two buildings in the portfolio get their tax exemption, and you know, I think we're all open to exploring the possibility for uh, facilitating future development, but. You know, maybe maybe not have all of the details for that conversation for sure. in the scope of this hearing today. I, has HPD reached out to you about developing the additional four lots? No, we okay. we had we have not had a conversation about that because the priority is to convert this large portfolio, which uh, we're in the process of doing now. Okay. Uh, between now and the next uh, hearing, would you be open to just talking with HPD and it? it whether you're you're selling your land in order to support the existing portfolio or uh, what have you, just having an idea of what we're going to do with the additional four lots and how quickly we can get them developed. A absolutely, and just for the record, that for sale sign is not ours. I don't know <laughs> what what you you're looking at, but we we would need permission from HPD to carve out the lots um, to to sell them in support of debt service for this deal. So that is not our for sale sign. Okay.
that is, that is helpful. So um, give me one moment. I just want to get through the regular feature questions. Uh, what type, what is the uh, value on the text abatement uh, over the course of the abatement as well as today? So the cumulative tax, excuse me, the cumulative tax benefit is approximately $924,000. $985, and the net present value of the exemption benefits is 31000 I'm sorry, $301,381. Sorry, give me one moment. <clears throat> and in terms of it, is there any additional HPD subsidy beyond the Article 11 already in the project? Yes, there is. There is an HPD uh, capital loan uh, that is about $6,000 per uh, dwelling unit, uh, which is well below the, uh, max the, uh, the term limit, the, the max term limit, which is $20,000 per DU, which is what uh, we are willing to give as a maximum. So how many dwelling units? Uh, 259 units total in the, in, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, 359 units total. In the, uh, in the greater portfolio. So $2.154 million. I think, I mean, yeah, I think it's about two point, yes, or yeah, mm -hmm, just about. Okay, uh, is there any HTC f subsidy on this project? No, there is not. Are there, is there any state subsidy on this project? Uh, there is some sort of state funds on the project, but it's outside of the scope of the project. It's uh, the, the buildings in uh, question received uh, some sort of funds for weatherization uh, to further better weatherize the buildings. But in, for this deal in particular, they, there are no state funds. So we're going to pause on questioning for one moment to uh, open the uh, roll. Continued vote on land use items 6G, 4, 65, 67, and 69. Council Member King. I vote aye. The final vote is five in the affirmative, zero negative, and zero abstentions, and the items are referred to the full land use committee. Any federal subsidies? No, there is not. Any low income housing tax credits? No, there is not. Okay. Uh, in terms of the uh, construction, this was all finished in 2015 or when did the when did these building the the loan closing so financing closed in 2015 the construction is actually still ongoing okay. uh, it's we hope to convert it soon okay so you're taking your part you're basically focused on existing buildings and then rehabilitating them and then turning them into affordable extending their affordability so these were already affordable and we entered into a 32-year regulatory agreement um, that consolidated all five. The, this, this 33 building portfolio um, originally was broken up amongst five different limited partnerships and HDFCs. So we, uh, we consolidated everything and we entered into a new 32-year regulatory agreement with HPD. How many units are currently occupied and how many are vacant? Portfolio wide or the two buildings that we're talking about? Uh, I, I believe I can only ask you about the two buildings. <laughs> okay, so I, I, so they, I think they're 100% occupied. There's very little turnover in this, in, in this deal. And uh, what is the, uh, what are the AMIs? of the existing tenants and when they vacate, what will be the new AMIs? And I have a note here about a set aside for homeless. Is that for the existing tenants or for your future tenants? So your first question is what is the existing rents? As of right now, out of the eight total units in the two buildings, there's one unit at 40% or 
or less than AMI. There's one unit at between 40 and 50, I'm sorry, six units between 50 and 40% AMI, and there's one unit between 60 and 50% of AMI. Your second question was about the uh, affordability for the entire project? No, that's or, the set aside. Oh, is it the homeless set aside? So we now know what the current incomes are. Mm -hmm. If those people vacate, what will the new incomes be? So we actually currently don't have the information for what those specific uh, AMIs will be for those eight units. We only have what the goal is, the AMI targets are for the full 359 units and the 33 buildings. I believe you just opened the door to the, the entire portfolio. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you, however you wish to proceed, we do need to know uh, whether or not, do you know, does the developer know if they are intending to maintain the affordability at the current rates? Yes, I do. I would like to review the regulatory agreement because, as, as Seth said, um, we don't have the the carve out for these two buildings. But overall, um, the majority of the units are going to families at 60 percent and below. There is a higher tier um, that is not the majority of the units, though. I don't have those figures in front of me. Fifty of the units go to. Um, sorry, I'll get this. Fifty of the units. Um, for tenants at or below 50% of AMI, 259 of the units uh, to tenants um, at or below 60% of AMI, and 50% of the units going to tenants at or below 165 of AMI. Uh, the <laughs> so 16 are going to people at 165% of AMI? If that's the ratio, yeah. I don't have a calculator in front of me. Sorry, what type of question? Sorry. 50%, 50 units of the 359, whatever that ratio is. Mm -hmm. So if that's, if it's against, or it's like not taking, I don't know. Those are the income bands. Th those are the income bands. Th those are the income bands. However, these are rent stabilized units that are registered with the state. So we, we, we register annually um, with the state and don't take we haven't been able to take a lot of vacancies. So for, for HPD, what is the interaction between, so, so if any of these 50 units fell into this eight units that we're talking about, is it is it possible that people would have to be at 165% of AMI in order to qualify for these units? Well, she just mentioned these are subject to rent stabilization as, as well. So does, it, is there an income, does the income restriction apply to any of the units? I'm not talking about the rent rate, I'm talking about the income restriction just to get into the unit. No. Well, all of the units are, are occupied right now and subject to rent stabilization, so that's another level. we can get more clarity on this and whether or not these eight units are part of this and uh, what we're looking at in terms of somebody, a 165% of AMI, uh, I don't know if, the, how, how much income is that for a single person? We don't have that number I talked about. Is it somewhere around $120,000 or higher? I only have 2017 AMIs in <laughs> with me right now. For the 2017 <laughs> AMIs? Um, 165 isn't even on there. That's right. 165 is not on this card. Um, we'll we'll get you more information about the the full regulatory agreement and sure. what it means for for these buildings. Uh, in, in terms of these two buildings or the whole portfolio, uh, what kinds of violations are we seeing in this? I do not have, we, we do not have the violations for the full portfolio. 
uh, but we do have the violations for the buildings in question. Currently, they have two C violations, uh, zero A violations and zero B violations. Uh, and what are the nature of the C violations? I, I do not know at this very second, but we can follow up. Great, and that that's, HPD issues a number of violations. Two violations seems to be a, a low number. How much is it going to cost to do the rehabilitation on this with uh, such a low, what may be a low violation count? I'm, a, I'm afraid that may actually depend on the actual violation in question. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to follow up after. Uh, it, it, so okay, what just for the developer, what kind of rehabilitation will we be doing with these locations? The, the scope of work um, for, for all of the buildings in, in, the, in the cluster uh, was mostly envelope work. So uh, building systems, boilers, he water heaters, roofs, and facade work. Um, the property manager has maintained them in very good shape. And so with HPD builds walkthrough and HPD programs uh, observation of the unit um, conditions, uh, that's why we were able to keep the HPD subsidy so low uh, and didn't didn't um, didn't go up to the 20 percent uh, to twenty thousand dollars per DU uh, per the term sheet for the program um, we put in about 1.5 of our own equity and um, and we also have a senior uh, private loan on this deal so the scope of work was mostly envelope work not not so much uh, te uh, unit work and so some of the work is done, some of it is ongoing? Overall, the project's at, at above 90% of completion. Okay. In terms of the work that was being done in terms of rehabilitation, uh, the people who did the work have health, disability, or pension benefits? We, we subcontract, the GC subcontracts that out, so I can't speak to the, um, what the vendors provide for their workers. Are there any building service workers or other people who help maintain and operate the facilities? And do those people have health disability or pension benefits? Yes, we have um, supers and porters there. Um, they are part of the 621 union. Um, and they, they work for the management company. And, and I can give you more detail on, on the benefits package for those projects. Yeah, yes, please. And uh, the folks in uh, who are operating uh, are they getting paid a minimum wage or are they being paid a wage that is uh, competitive with other buildings in the area? Uh, the, the site staff is paid, um, the maintenance staff is paid per the union schedule and the property management staff is paid competitive, competitive salaries. Uh, in terms of the existing work, the remaining work, were any minority and women uh, business enterprises uh, used? Um, well, CB Manual itself, the sponsor, we are minority certified through Small Business Services and through the state of New York. We're seeking port authority right now. Um, so we're the sponsor, so. In terms of the, the people, the contractor, the GC, the subs, the architects, the consultants? The architect is, is, a, is a minority owned business as well. Um, as far as the general contract, I, I would have to follow ask those questions, I'm not, I'm not sure at this time. Uh, what are, were any folks hired from the local community or is there contemplation to hire from the local community? Um, that's a question for the general contractor. Um, as far as uh, who, <coughs> who was, was used, um, as far as the labor for the construction, I can't speak to that, but as far as building staff and property management staff, they're all, they're all from the immediate neighborhood. Thank you, we look forward to getting the remainder of the questions answered and uh, it seems that we have two questions that may be ripe for oversight on this committee. One about just projects with vacant lots and the second just in that same scope, vacant lots adjacent to projects and the use of eminent domain. So and it also seems like in a different project that we had before us, we had a vacant lot and then adjacent to it another 
vacant lot that we could have used in a domain to move a little bit quicker on. So I want to ask if there's anyone to testify on this project. Any other members of the public? Seeing none, I will close this hearing and excuse this panel. All the items we held hearings on today, as well as land use item 66, have, will be laid over. I would like to thank uh, committee counsel Julie Lubin and the land use staff for preparing today's hearing and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned.